the man that trusted in him. I thank God this morning. Let me see another day. But when I think of the goodness of God and all that he has done for me, for you, for all of us, my soul cries out hallelujah this morning. And I praise God for saving me this morning. First of all, I want to say, give an honor to my God, to my pastor, Brother Mitchell, to his lovely wife, Minister Mitchell. Uh, I thank her for the word she gave on last, on last Sunday. You look at her, she's guilty now. She had a word. And I thank her. I thank God for Minister Washington and your wife, to my lovely wife. Good to be here this morning. And to my family, the Goodwill Missionary Baptist Church family. Thank you all this morning for those that are visiting with us here and those that are streaming live. God is good. He's good. This morning I will be coming from 2 Samuel 9, chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. And I'll read verses 1 through 5 from the New Revised Standard Version. And David asked, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and he was summoned to David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, at your service. The king said, is there anyone remaining of the house of Saul to whom I may show my kindness of God? Ziba said to the king, there remains a son of Jonathan. He's crippled in his feet. The king said to him, where is he? Ziba said to the king, he's in the house of Makur, son of Abiel, at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Makur, son of Amiel, at Lodabar. And this morning, from that scripture text, I would take the first verse. David asked, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul whom I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? You may be seated. Amen, amen. This morning, my text this morning, or my topic would be left in Lodabar, but restored by God's grace. But restored by God's grace. I find in this text that it's difficult to pan after God if you don't know where God is. All of you who are believers of Christ this morning must understand that whatever your situations of life challenges may be, just know that God is aware of your plight or whatever you may be experiencing today. God knows what we are all going through. Our God has a plan for each of us and he moves providentially in our lives. Often we, we, often when God is moving, it seems as if he's moving slowly. And in many instances, it seems as if he's not moving at all. But I assure you that our God is working behind the scenes on your behalf, on my behalf, connecting us with his promises never to leave us nor forsake us. Today's text focuses on two main characters. David, a man after God's own heart, and Mephibosheth, the grandson of Saul and the son of Jonathan. This is a story about the stress of encountering and experiencing calls by transformation. It's a story about an invitation that was accepted. It's a story about friendship, promises, grace, love, compassion, forgiveness, and hope. A king expressed one of the most beautiful acts of kindness to an outcast. But long before that, for years, the half-crazed lunatic named Saul had obsessively hunted David, Deacon Mountain, like big game. Uh, put yourself in David's shoes for a moment. As I can reflect on 1 Samuel chapter 19, the king whom David honored sought to kill him. Saul was stopped at nothing, even at sacred boundaries. When David seeks sanctuary with Israel's esteemed prophet Samuel, it's now, it is now determined that Saul no longer fears God, except for God's intervention. Saul would have killed David in Samuel's very own house. And I find that David totally trusted God in everything that he did. 
He had proved who God was in his life as a shepherd boy against the lions and the bears. He had proved who his God was as he killed Goliath and freed the Israelites from the Philistines' threat. He knew that God could vindicate him in his dispute with Saul. As I paraphrase 1 Samuel 24 and 12, David says, My Lord avenged me against you, but I won't do it. He wanted justice, but he wanted God, the ultimate judge, to, to deliver it. If we learn to trust God and let him vindicate us, trust me, God can do a much better job selling the scores. In my life, I've seen God vindicate me. He delivered me when my enemies tried to trip me up. He advanced me when my enemy attempted to hinder my progress. And while I yet didn't understand what God was doing in my life, God orchestrated the plan. Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. I'm often reminded of how the Apostle Paul suffered great injustice at many people's, at many people's hands. But he encourages his readers every day to have the right attitude to injustice against them. But Romans 12, 17 and 21 says, Repay no one for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it's written, vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will put heaping coals on his head. So don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. God protected his servant David wherever he went. And whatever he did. And Prince Jonathan respected and loved David for that. Yeah. Jonathan even went so far as telling of disclosing of his father's plans to David. And he warned him whenever he knew of such plans. Yeah. Uh -huh. And he did that despite the fact that somehow, somehow Jonathan knew that David someday would take place of his father. Mm -hmm. He would take place of the throne and become the next king instead of himself. But because of a time with Jonathan, his dearest friend, it came a time when he could no longer even associate with David. Because David put others in danger of just being in their presence. But David is on his own and he's a fugitive. He's running for his life. But yes, God was with him during his time of despair. David is desperate and without resources to make an escape. And there's times when we must learn as Proverbs 3 and 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all our ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct our path. I learned that God always leaves our most brutal and toughest enemy around us so that we can learn to trust in him. No word to hear this morning that we need God to do whatever it takes to keep us desperate for him so we don't begin to wonder. But when David was not desperate for God, he was more vulnerable of his self-destructive wickedness. It's not a secret. David developed a love-hate relationship with Saul. Have you ever been around Saul? Have you ever been around Saul? You know the saying as Eddie and the OJs would say, they smile in your face, always trying to take your place. Talk about the backstab. David spared Saul's life in the cave. I remember in, in 1 Samuel 26, he spared Saul's life while he was sleeping. Yeah. One of his guys named Abishai said to David, God has handed your enemy into your hands today. He said, let me pin him to the ground with one spear. He said, it won't take two so I can do it with one spear. But, but because of who David was, he told Abishai, don't kill him. No one can lift a hand against Lord's anointing and go unpunished. As surely as you live, David continued, it will be the Lord who would strike him down. Or his day will come and he will die or he will fall in the battle and be destroyed. And everyone knows that Saul took his own life. But you can't mistreat God's children. You can't mistreat God's children. God removed 
He removed Saul and gave Saul's kingdom and much more to David. Now that Saul was dead, David had been crowned king Israel. And in those days, it was a common thing. It was a common practice to exterminate all the members of the previous dynasty to prevent a descendant from seeking the throne. But even in that, David's response was quite the contrary. He asked the question this morning, is there anyone remaining from Saul's family that I can show kindness because of Jonathan? Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and 11 in becoming intentional in blessing others. I need you to understand that the kind is often noted as smacks of softness. David is now being intentional. David has some unfinished business to take care of. David was expressing a more profound demonstration of love undeserved, a love unearned and unrepayable. See, it's bigger than you think. David had made a promise to his best friend, Jonathan. He had made a pact with him because he was his beloved friend, the son of Saul, that he would show kindness to the remaining members of Saul's household. David now intended to keep his promise. David remembered the covenant that he had made with his best friend, and he asked, is there anyone left from Saul's family? When David became king, the scripture tells us that they fled with fear. Because they thought that he would take retributions out on them for how they had for how Saul had treated them. Finally, the only remaining blood of Saul's family was not a simple matter. But David located a grandson by the name of Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan. Ziba, a servant of Saul, tells David about Jonathan, Jonathan's son, who was crippled as a child when he was dropped. When David took over, the nurse was running with Mephibosheth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he dropped him at, at the age of five. Right. And he was crippled from that time on. Yeah, right. When they tried to flee the palace for fear. Yeah. Mephibosheth's feet was crippled and he was in a place called Lodabar. Uh -huh. The words mean no pasture. Yeah. No word or no communication. Uh -huh. right. Lodabar is a place where no one wants to visit. Uh -huh. Lodabar is a place where no one wants to call you. Lodabar is a place where no one wants to stop to see about you. AT&T, Verizon, does not reside in Lodabar. There are no phone signals, no internet connections, no Facebook. Lodabar is, is where the low life lives. Undoubtedly, somebody present here today may feel like they've been in Lodabar. It's a place where one finds themselves trying to explain and make excuses of why you're in Lord of God. It's not your fault for the mishaps in life. Uh -huh. My chef is now years older, whose name means he scatters shame uh -huh. or destroying shame. He has come to face with David. And he had fell flat on the floor in act of submission. Yeah. The Bible says he referred to himself as a dead dog. Uh -huh. Many had felt like he had no work, he had no value. He didn't know how things was going to work out. All he knew was that the kings had a way of destroying the remaining of the families, the remnants of the family. Amen. Goodwill, I stop by to remind you this morning that there are places in which many of us perhaps should be by now. But by the grace of God, yes. God has changed our circumstances. Yes. But on the other hand, maybe you were dropped by someone as you, as you has been delayed in your blessing or arriving to your destination. You may have been delayed, but you're not denied. But we serve a true and a living God. It's not your fault that, you, that someone has made you a promise. But in the course of it all, they dropped you. Mm. Let's keep it real today because somebody gave you a ray of hope in your moments of despair, and they dropped you. Come on. Maybe some program was offered, and they rejected you. Perhaps a, a, a health care program was promised and they canceled or, 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 or they dropped you. Perhaps someone dropped you within a relationship this morning. But I serve you notice today to know that no matter how and when they dropped you, they positioned you in Lodabar. Come on. But not knowing that the God that we serve, he is the author and the finisher. Yes. They constantly reminded you that you were born on the wrong side of the track. You are frequently reminded that you are nobody 
and you'll never be successful in life. Therefore, the pressures of life leave you in the constant fear of unknown. The enemy is as a roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may devour. But God tells us in Isaiah 41 and 12, though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. For I am the Lord your God, who will take hold of your right hand. Yes. And he says, do not fear, I will help you. Stop by to tell you this morning, you may be a notable, but we serve a God that will pick you up. He'll turn you around. He'll, he'll put your feet on solid ground. God has left us here for a reason this morning. Each one of us, we have been left here for a reason. And just know that no man, no devil can hinder you from your blessing. We serve a God that promised to never leave us nor forsake us. So I come to declare this morning that God is coming to bring someone out of Lodabar, out of a Lodabar situation today. As believers, regardless of the extent of your spiritual maturity, it's possible to reach a point so low in life that we actually feel that everyone, even God, has abandoned us. That was David's desperate condition when he wrote Psalm 13. He asked the question, how long, oh Lord? How long? How many times have we asked the Lord, how long? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you going to keep me in this situation? Yeah. How much longer do I have to go down this, this empty road? How long do I have to go without finding out what my life is going to be about? Will you forget me forever? My God. Seems like an endless struggle, Lodabar. When I lost God's blessings, Lodabar. When my mind seemed so troubled this morning, Lodabar. When I began to doubt, to doubt God's plans, Lodabar. Yeah. Despite David's imperfection, God continued to love and use David, even in his time of backsliding. God can take us and use us when we're at our worst. Yes, he can. Yes, he can. God can take us and use us when we're at our worst. My favorite chef was a member of the enemy family. But God had a special invitation waiting on him. David's love was exemplary of the love of God. And our God is an intentional God. And every day God shows us kindness. He shows us mercy. We are the undeserving, but he keeps on blessing us. We are unworthy, but he keeps on caring for us. We are worthless, but he keeps on striving with us. We are unfit, but he keeps on forgiving us. We are ungrateful, but he keeps on loving us. Yes. He keeps on showing up. Yes. As only God can do. Yes. Blessing us despite of our no goodness. God is calling us to a higher place. Yeah. He's calling us to a higher place to work for him, to be a part of the family of God. Mephibosheth was crippled, living in obscurity and poverty. He's in a remote and barren corner of the kingdom. Once found, the man was nearly unpronounceable. He had an unpronounceable name. And in my imagination, I could see him just a hobbling yeah. along the way because he had been crippled. Yeah. But no doubt, his mind began to play tricks on him. Yeah. Perhaps questioning himself. What would they think of me when I do go to David? What would they think of me when they see my condition? What would they think of me when they see that I belong to King Saul? Yeah. He had dealt with hardship. He had dealt with suffering as a young, as a young child. And he had learned to be a survivor. Yeah. Suffering a tragic fall as a baby that left him permanently without the use of either leg. He was crippled and disabled. Mm -hmm. But David tells the servant to bring Mephibosheth from Lodabar. Mm -hmm. And when Mephibosheth arrived, David said, don't be afraid. I will be kind to you for your father's sake, Jonathan. No doubt, when he appeared before David, I'm sure he expected the worst. But David said, I will restore to you all of your grandfather's saws fields, and I will give you meals at my table. When we're sitting at God's table, uh, goodwill, I have to say this morning, no one can see your crippled legs. No one can see your condition when you're at God's table. Come on! No one can see your brokenness when you're at God's yes. table. No one can see your sinful ways when you're at God's table. And no one can see your past history when you're sitting at God's table. Yes! The God I serve will cover your conditions. 
He'll cover up your hurt. He'll cover up your pain. Yes. Pain circumstances. Yes. They the words were not just a token of justice. They were extravagant, symbolic of his love for Jonathan. Yes. His words were an act of grace, symbolic of God's love for David. Uh -huh. This was a demonstration of love toward man who did not deserve it. Yeah. To a man that could not ever earn it and would never be able to repay it. They reached out to the cripple and the outcast and expressed kindness to him as he had never known before. Mephibosheth is seeing God's plan in the midst of his circumstances. Yeah, yeah. We too can see God's plan in the midst of our circumstances. We open up and give our hearts to the Lord. Yeah, yeah. He went from tragedy to triumph. God spoke these words to him. You are coming out of Lodabar. Yeah. Blessings follow an intentional life, not perceived. We must learn to live by what we know and no longer how we feel. The scripture says in Romans 1, 17, the just shall live by faith. Lodabar was a city in Manasseh. The name means no pasture, no word, no communication. But God promises us in Psalm 23 and 2. It is in Psalm 23 and 2 is that we are to rest in green pastures. It's ironic that this place, Lodabar, also means no word, yeah. no spiritual food in Lodabar. Yeah. But God tells us, rest in the freshness of abundance of his word. Yeah. But when we let his fear drive us to Lodabar, yeah. we can't allow fear to drive us to Lodabar. Yeah. We have to put our trust in God. Yeah. God words, when we live in fear, we can't hear God, we can't see God, we can't feel his presence. Yeah. We have to learn to Open up our hearts and let and let and, 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 and let God come into us so that we can understand what He is trying to tell us. Allowing Him to lead us in the right way. Philip was restored to his rightful position at the king's table, seated in the heavenly places, and received his rightful possessions. David gave Mephibosheth back everything that belonged to Saul, but he could not receive the possessions until he was in position. Church, we got to get in position. Amen. We got to put ourselves in position. Yes. In order to receive what we want from God. Yeah. That right position to be is in the presence of God to hear his word. Yeah. You get in a position to receive by fasting, by praying, by worshiping, yeah. studying God's word, yeah. exercising your faith, walking in obedience, and loving your neighbors as yourself. Yeah. Yeah. But remember these words in Matthew 6 and 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Many have fallen and also crippled, but we don't have to stay there. We are lame from our falls. We are running from our, our lives and we are tripped and fallen in the process of it all. But we have fallen into trouble. We have fallen into confusion. We have fallen out of the will of God. We have fallen into sin. We have fallen into the ways of this sensitive world. And we have fallen to the yokes and the burdens of life. We also have fallen to the ways instead of God's ways. We've fallen into some ugly ways. Some things that we've learned over the course of time simply because we did not know the Lord. But there are times we often find ourselves in load of our infested circumstances just as David expressed his despair because God has seen him so far away. And he too was seeking restoration. These are the times, some, sometimes we say that our tears have been our food yeah. night and day. But I serve you notice this morning. Restoration comes only when you are in a, in a covenant with God yeah. who can supply all of our needs. Yeah. God will bring you out a load of all for a place of, from a place of desolation, from a place of isolation yeah. and separation from him. He can bring you out a load of all into a place where his presence is abundant. It is a place of rest. It is a place of green pastures. It is a place where there is no fear of condemnation. It's a place of anticipation, restoration, and restitution. So I invite you to the king's table this morning. Come on in to where the table is free. And the feast of the Lord is going on. Joy is here where the table is free. It's over here, church. If you're seeking healing for your soul, it's over here. If you're seeking, uh, 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 if you're seeking love, peace, joy, rather than sorrow, there is hope for tomorrow, church. There is hope for tomorrow. 
And darling, today someone is experiencing pain and sorrow. Somebody's experiencing discomfort from living a reckless life this morning. But I implore you today. I invite you today. I entreat you today to come out of Lodabar. Come out of Lodabar to a pure relationship with God. Come out of Lodabar to victory over Satan. Come out of Lodabar this morning to victory in Jesus. Many can witness this morning that because he lives. Because he lives, yes. I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Yes. Because he lives, I know that he holds the future. And life is worth living just because he lives. Amen. Somebody here today has tried everything. Why not try Jesus? Why not try our God? As our brothers get ready to come this morning. Would there be one that is looking for a change? Yeah. A change of heart. Yeah. A change of the way that we are living. Yeah. Our God is waiting to accept you into the family of God.